Now, this was the intended video to start this year. Now that Microsoft is hopefully not doing anything too problematic between the time of filming this video and editing and uploading, please. What is the year of Linux? Is it the year that Linux computers exceed Windows computers in market share? Or is it the year that Linux computers exceed Mac OS computers in market share? Could it be it's the year that Linux market share finally hits double digits, being 10%? Depending on who you are, that definition could vary greatly. And some might even argue that we've already had the year of Linux, more on that later. But assuming it hasn't happened yet, and we're either waiting for these events or something else to happen that's similar, Let's ask the question, could 2026 be the year of Linux? And if not, why not? If we're measuring by the first metric, being that the number of Linux computers, desktop computers, not servers, we're not talking about servers, desktop users, but the number of desktop users on Linux exceeds the number of desktop users on Windows. That metric alone? Nope, not, nada, zitch, zilp, not gonna happen, not anytime soon. But what about the second metric? Hopefully we're not waiting on Mac OS users to make the jump because honestly, there's not a lot of need for them to do that unless they want gaming. In which case they can still use Mac OS for all of their business or work related things and then would use something else such as Linux for gaming because Apple doesn't really care about gaming as much as they pretend to. So let's look at the third metric, 10%. Doesn't seem much to ask for, right? Except we're talking about a lot and a lot and a lot of people. So it kind of is, but it's not impossibly out of reach. But whichever definition you wanna pick, let's look at the factors stopping people from migrating from Windows to Linux. And to simplify this, let's break it down into two sections. The first side is the technological side. How easy is it to use a Linux computer for a Windows user? There needs to be as little learning curves or obstacles in their way as humanly possible. But basically, if you were to put a Linux laptop in front of a Windows user, could they just use it as normal? If you're a long time viewer of this channel and you've seen any of these other videos, then you already know the answer to this question. But for those of you who are new here, or those who just want a refresher, let's start with what Linux is. Linux is not just one operating system. It's a lot of operating systems. Amongst those operating systems are some that are easier to use and some that are harder to use. Each of these operating systems individually are called distributions, and they can vary greatly depending on what they're designed for. Here are a few examples that we've looked at. Bazite is an extremely popular gaming distribution focused on making sure that you can play as many of your Windows games as possible on Linux. Updates are automatic and you have a lot of stuff installed out of the box, such as Steam and other tools like Lutris, which can be used to get EA games working through the EA launcher. But perhaps you don't want something specifically gaming focused. Well, peel a back a layer. There's Fedora, which is what Bazite is based off. Or if neither of them look good to you, you could look at Nubara, which is similar to Bazite based off of Fedora, but managed by one person named Glorious Eggroll. Worth checking out for the cool name alone. Or perhaps you've heard of Ubuntu, as it is kind of the default Linux distribution and has been for many years. Well, as we've discovered on this channel, maybe give the default version of Ubuntu a miss. However, other distributions based off of Ubuntu are actually great. Some of them include Tuxedo OS, Pop OS, and Linux Mint. Or perhaps you've heard a lot about Steam OS, which is based off of Arch. So far, we've looked at distributions based off Fedora and Ubuntu, which is Debian. But Arch is what Steam OS is based off. So you want a distribution based off of that? Well, you have Manjaro, which is built off Arch Linux. But so far in testing, the difference between Arch and Fedora isn't actually that great. Fedora seems to be a good middle point between the stability of Debian-based distros and 
the cutting edge, go as fast as you possibly can of Arch. So any of these distributions mentioned, you'll be right at home and you don't need to use a terminal to get them up and running. Perhaps you're concerned about compatibility for your hardware then. If you have an NVIDIA GPU, then your situation is always improving on Linux. But if you have an AMD GPU, then you've had excellent Linux support for many, many years already. So either of these are ready to go. Most Linux distributions will detect your hardware and automatically download all the drivers they need after you've installed, clicked update, and done your first restart. And no full screen ads after it, at least for the distributions we've looked at. We leave that for Windows. Now, if you want an example of some particular hardware used on Linux, then there will be a video coming up showcasing capture cards, audio interfaces, various keyboards and mice, and we'll look at how easy it is to plug those things in. But a little bit of a spoiler alert, most of that stuff is just plug and play. There's the occasional caveat here and there, but let's not pretend that things just work as they're intended to on Windows. For software, you've got Steam, Discord, Spotify, and many other native apps or even community-based apps getting your favorite programs over to Linux. As for web browsers, you have an enormous amount of choice there. So much choice that you could even install Microsoft Edge and sacrifice all the privacy you've just regained by installing Linux. As mentioned before, for your third-party games, there's Lutris for EA and Ubisoft. We'll be looking at Ubisoft in a video in the future. And we'll also look at getting Epic Games and God Games in their own dedicated videos. Perhaps you're concerned about productivity? Let's start with video editors. This video is currently being edited on Caden Live, which is a free and open source video editor designed specifically for Linux. You might have heard that DaVinci Resolve even works on Linux, but that's a bit of a tricky one. It officially supports it, but look, we'll do it in a separate video, okay? Digital audio workstations are covered with Reaper and Adore. 3D animation is sorted with Blender, and if you just need an office suite for some basic office work, you have OpenOffice and LibreOffice. So far, that's gamers, video editors, audio engineers, 3D animators, and general office work covered on Linux. And there's so much more that is available depending on your needs. Not to mention high compatibility with a lot of hardware. So it's safe to say that in the year 2026, the technology side of Linux is definitely covered. Better yet, unlike big tech corporations, this technology actually gets better with time with community efforts driven at improving the experience, especially for what the community actually wants, i.e. not AI. And part of this drive was definitely the introduction of the Steam Deck, being that that did drive up the market share a bit and introduced a lot of people to the concept of playing on Linux. So guess what's coming this year? The Steam Machine. And hopefully that will bump up the market share as well, introducing even more people to the world of not being trapped by Windows. So it doesn't seem the issue is technology. So what is it then? Well, let's look at the other side of the equation, the social aspect. It doesn't matter if you have the best technological advances in the world at your fingertips. Unless you find a way to quote unquote, sell them, your technology might as well not exist to the general public. Let's compare our current predicament to another industry. Are there any car enthusiasts in the audience? Perhaps you know almost everything there is to know about your particular vehicle. You have a general knowledge of most cars in the market. You keep up to date with newer models. You know which of the older models actually stand the test of time. And it's just generally something you're passionate about. So, stands to reason that should any of your friends and family want to, you know, get a car, they might come to you for advice if they know you're that passionate about it. But then how many of us have those friends or family members that it doesn't matter what you tell them. They seem to always buy the worst possible model of vehicle every single year in a row. They always end up going to the mechanic and spending way too much money because these vehicles have endless problems and yet they'll go and repeat the same mistake over and over again regardless of what you tell them 
And this can be incredibly frustrating because the answers are right there. You've already done the work. You're not asking them to become a car enthusiast. You're not asking them to crack open their hood and maintain their own engine. You already know everything that needs to be done, but they still won't listen. Why? Because you're not the sleazy salesman who always knows how to butter up their ego. You're giving them the truth, not what they want to hear. And isn't it weird how many people were willing to trust a sleazy salesman? Switching gears again back to our own industry. This is more of a personal tale of a particular experience which the person's identity shall remain anonymous, but if they were watching this video, they know exactly who they are. So it goes something like this. This person was a console gamer and the year was roughly 2020. The Xbox Series X and the PS5 were just being introduced to the market. And as you might well be aware, dear viewer, these consoles did not really live up to the hype. Not the same way that the Xbox One X and the PS4 Pro did the generation before. No, this was a bit of a disappointment. So this led to more of a migration from some people from console to PC. And as this person's technical advisor, for lack of a better term, it was decided that the best thing for them would be to build a gaming PC. They are a gamer after all. So after many months of research and looking into the prices and trying not to have to pay scalper prices on top of that, this was during a global pandemic, and all the other hurdles, finding the best combination and the usual ins and outs of building a PC, they had their technical advisor for every step of the way. So after building, teaching, maintaining, and finally getting this person up and gaming, mission accomplished. And that mission was to build a PC that was very close to the console specs at the time. But a week later, a phone call. It's the person who we just built a PC for. And they say without missing a beat, they wanna buy a PS5. You see all those shiny ads being plastered absolutely everywhere for the newest console and the talk amongst friends, everyone talking about how they paid scalper prices for a PS5, which at the time didn't have any games on it. For some people, that's water off a duck's back, but for most people, that's enough to push them over the edge. Whether they need whatever product their friends are talking about and whatever they're being advertised to or not. This person didn't end up buying a PS5, by the way, and they're very happy with their gaming PC all these years later. So back to the focus of this video. Windows has been trying for four decades to try and convince us that it is the best operating system to have in our homes. Back in the 80s, they were just trying to convince us to have a computer in our home, but that's four decades worth of a big corporation advertising and pushing the idea of Windows being the place to be. And was Windows the best operating system? Sometimes it was. Other times, it really wasn't. But what mattered was the public perception. Have you ever met a diehard Windows fan who thinks that using a Mac is the equivalent of painting a pentagram on the ground and sacrificing the blood of a firstborn? I know there are people on the Mac side who also think that way about Windows, but for the focus of this video, we'll be focusing on the Windows stance. Even with the push from Microsoft to steal your data, bake ads into your operating system, compromise your personal security and personal details, and genuinely make features that worked in previous versions of Windows completely broken now, just to shovel a little bit of AI there to steal more of your data, there will still be people out there who will swear by Windows and defend it as if it was their own mother. Whether it be for the sake of nostalgia, fondly remembering using an earlier version of Windows as a child and all the games and experiences they had with a computer, or because they just really don't want to switch sides because they've been team Windows for so long. Some people consider this operating system ride or die. But this group of people are not the whole picture. Another group are the not so tech savvy, including the elderly. People who don't have a lot of experience with computers, use it for very basic things, and don't really have to use it for any professional work and aren't necessarily gamers and, you know, the sorts of people who just want to look up their favorite website. 
Those people are exactly the people that Windows is currently taking advantage of with their full screen ads. And they're not about to look up a video about how to download a Linux ISO and flash a USB with Ventoy and then boot into the BIOS to boot into their USB to install a brand new operating system. But perhaps these elderly people or just not so tech savvy people have family and friends who are tech savvy and do know how to download an ISO file, flash a USB with a Ventoy, drag and drop the ISO file over to the USB, boot into the BIOS, boot into the USB, and install a brand new operating system. One that isn't designed to take advantage of the less tech savvy people and steal their data. And then we have our final group. And this one's only a little less hopeless than the window stands. Corpos. Even if the stands suddenly have a change of heart and the not so tech savvy have family and friends flock in and wipe all their computers and install Linux, then you will still have a large portion of the market share who will be stuck on Windows because it's what their company uses. Whether it's more than half of the market, who knows? But one thing's for sure, Windows has somehow cemented itself at the core of many businesses. But here's what's a bit odd. Businesses like to do two things. One, make as much money as possible, potentially by cutting costs, and two, protect confidential company data from getting out. A bit odd that you would use Microsoft's Windows for both of these tasks, considering Windows is designed to not do both of these things. So how many cloud subscriptions is your boss paying for? Because clearly all of their data is safe in the cloud with Microsoft and keeping all your data on local machines is certainly not an option anymore with Windows. You can't just save to your documents folder. Which, by the way, if you're still running Windows, go and check that Windows hasn't automatically started syncing all of your documents over to OneDrive at the time of filming. This is still an issue with Windows. But back to the corpo world, the amount of money that these companies would save if they stopped blowing it on cloud subscriptions pushed by Microsoft would be staggering. Not to mention that having local servers would definitely help with security for all of that confidential data. You really don't want to be putting anything on Microsoft's servers if you can avoid it. But instead of replacing Windows, your bosses are likely looking to replace you with AI that can barely do your job. But those are just some of the examples as to why it's unlikely to be the year of Linux, at least by the beating Windows or beating Mac OS definitions. There are other groups of people, such as professionals whose entire teams use Adobe and are stuck in that ecosystem, another subscription-based model that really doesn't need to be and definitely compromises your personal data. So those people would have to not just change what computer they're working on and the apps they're using, but the other people working on those as well. But as mentioned before, the Steam Machine is on the horizon. And hopefully with that comes the official release of SteamOS, meaning that you could install Valve's very own operating system based on Linux on your computer hardware. There are lots of people who have said they're waiting for that. However, I'd encourage them to start experimenting with other Linux operating systems because it's likely they could jump ship already and don't need to wait for Valve because we don't know how long that's going to be. Will it beat Windows though? Even with Microsoft trying to burn all their goodwill to the ground just for the sake of convincing Microsoft shareholders that AI definitely isn't a fad or a bubble waiting to pop? Eh, no, it won't, unfortunately. At least not without external help. Windows didn't just magically make it into people's households. People had to go and buy computers with Windows on them. And speaking of buying computers, can it beat Apple's market share? Unlikely but not completely impossible. As for the 10%, that definitely has a chance. Perhaps with other Steam Machine and Steam Deck competitors or copycats, especially if those companies are willing to take a chance and not install the absolutely bloated and unnecessary Windows onto handheld hardware that doesn't need to be slowed down by Windows. But if you're tired of being used by Microsoft, you don't have to wait for any of these things to happen. You can switch to Linux today. Check out any of these videos on this channel and you can get started today leaving Windows behind once and for all.